One of our elders encouraged me this week to thank you all again, and I'm glad to do so. All through the pandemic, um, since last March, you have been so careful and so gracious to follow the state's guidelines for our assemblies the best we could do, as our elders have asked us to. You have made our elders' work, our deacons' work, my work, a lot easier by simply having a kind attitude toward us and toward each other during a stressful time. We are so proud of this church and so grateful to be a part of it. And so uh, thank you so much once again. This has been a rough year for churches and for church leaders and maybe especially uh, for elders. Boy, Jim, what a year to retire from. (laughs) It's been a tough one. How do you as an elder or a leader in the church decide how the church should respond to a government order to close up and not meet together for a while, uh, for weeks, maybe even months. How do, you, uh, how do you respond? Do you obey that order? Do you refuse? What do you do? People who honor God as the highest authority in our lives cannot just blindly do whatever the state tells us to do. But at the same time, God does call us to obey our government. And so how do we know when it's right to obey government authorities and when it's right to disobey? This is a complex question. It does not have any easy answers, and so I will not give you any today. It's a tough question. But Scripture does give us some principles to help us discern when is the right time to go one way and when is the right time to go the other way. These are the principles that church leaders across the country and a lot of Christians generally, really around the world, have been thinking through this past year as we've responded to the constantly shifting dynamics of the pandemic and all the changes that it's brought about in the life of the church. Today I'd like us to look at four passages of Scripture, the longest one first, gradually getting shorter until the last one, beginning in the book of Acts, which we're studying through in this lesson series. We'll start in Acts chapter 5, and here's the situation. We've looked at uh, this story already. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and John heal a lame man in the temple in Jerusalem, and a crowd rushes to them to find out how this miracle happened, and Peter proclaims that the man who was healed was healed by faith in the name of Jesus. This is very early in the life of the church, uh, probably the first few weeks or months of the church. Then in chapter 4, the Jewish leaders have Peter and John arrested as they're preaching there, teaching in the temple, and they command them not to speak or teach in Jesus' name anymore. A government order. You will not do this anymore. But Peter, in chapter 4, verse 19, responds, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? Then Peter and John are released, having been warned, and the church has endured its first persecution, and the church prays for God to help them continue to speak his word boldly, and God answers that prayer, and they continue to spread the message of Jesus. We looked at this story a few weeks ago. Then we come to chapter 5, and our first and longest text this morning. Let's begin in chapter 5 and verse 12. Acts 5, verse 12. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go. Stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, and as they had been told, and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. 
So they went back and reported, We found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The the apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Thutis appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, all his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Well, the church is thriving in Acts chapter 5. The Jewish leaders become jealous. They arrest the apostles and put them in prison. But then an angel comes during the night and sets the apostles free. And the angel tells the apostles to proclaim the good news of new life in Jesus in the temple courts. And so they do. When the Jewish leaders call for the apostles to be brought into them, the apostles aren't there in the jail. They're out teaching in the temple again. And so the leaders... Have them brought in, but not by force, because the apostles have a lot of support among the people who are there in the temple listening to them, and the officials are afraid they'll be stoned if they try to bring the apostles in by force. But the apostles come willingly, and then the high priest reminds them that they were ordered not to teach in Jesus' name. But Peter replies, much like he did in chapter 4, we must obey God rather than human beings. And that verse is the starting point for this lesson today. When Peter keeps on talking about Jesus, the council is enraged and wants to execute the apostles. But a wise teacher named Gamaliel calms them down and persuades them to release the apostles. We'll talk more about Gamaliel next week. So the apostles are not killed, but they are flogged, and then they're released. And despite this persecution, they don't stop their ministry at all, but continue to proclaim the good news of Jesus. They disobey the direct command of the Sanhedrin and continue to speak and teach in Jesus' name. So when Peter and the other apostles declare in verse 29, we must obey God rather than human beings, what they're saying is that they will not recognize any authority in their lives higher than the authority of God alone. Not even the Sanhedrin, the highest authority in the Jewish government under the Roman Empire. And this is the position that every church and every believer has to take if we're going to be true to God as the highest authority in our lives. We will obey him over every other 
authority. So if the state or a judge or our teachers or our parents even require us to do what is against God's will, we cannot do it. We will disobey that authority in order to obey God. And it is necessary to do that sometimes. Corey Ten Boom wrote a book called The Hiding Place. In that book, it's become a Christian classic. She tells about her life in Holland during World War II. The German army invaded Holland and took control of it in 1941. The Nazi uh, regime uh, set up a new government in Holland. Jews in the community, people who were the Ten Boom family's neighbors, began disappearing. Some were known to have been arrested and imprisoned. Some just disappeared mysteriously. Some escaped. Those who had been captured, their neighbors often didn't know if they'd been imprisoned or killed or what had happened. Corey Ten Boom and her family, all Christians, wanted to help their Jewish neighbors. But first they had to figure out whether it was right in God's eyes to lie and break the law in order to hide Jewish neighbors from the Nazis and to steal ration cards for them so these innocent people in hiding could get food to eat. They decided that they had to defy the German authorities and help any Jews they could, reasoning that this was one of those times when, as believers, we must disobey the government in order to do the will of God. In nations like Iran, North Korea, China, it's hard to be a faithful Christian without violating the law in some way. Just meeting together to worship God can be illegal in many cases in those nations. And so the church there sometimes has to meet in secret. And they do, because we must obey God rather than human beings. On the other hand, you can see how it would be possible to take this principle too far. Say I'm driving to church one Sunday, I'm running late. That would never happen, just so you know. And the sign says 35, but I'm going 50, and the lights come on behind me, and the officer pulls me over, and he writes me a ticket, and I protest the ticket on the grounds that God wants me to be at worship on time. He wants me to go and worship him, and I must obey God rather than human beings. And so I had to exceed the speed limit. Think that's going to get anywhere in court? Probably not. Probably not. Don't try that one. It would be a sin against God if we violated the law in God's name when really we violated the law because we were doing what we wanted to do or because we were angry with the government or because for whatever reason we were running late for church. In Acts chapter 5, the apostles themselves actually refuse to disobey the authorities, even when they might have had reason to do so. It's in verse 26. The captain of the temple guard comes to arrest the apostles. And they could resist if they wanted to because the captain's not going to use force. He's worried about the reaction of the, the people. They're listening to the apostles, standing in support of them. But the apostles recognize the captain does have authority. And so when he asks the apostles to come with him, they do not resist, even though they can pretty well guess that they're going to be treated unjustly, which is, in fact, what happens. They end up being flogged, though they've done nothing wrong in God's sight, and they really haven't broken any, any law either. The apostles could resist at that moment, but there is nothing about submitting to this order to come and appear before the Sanhedrin that in itself would cause them to sin against God. And so even in this situation in which they might feel justified in, obeying, in disobeying the authorities, they submit instead. So there are times when Christians must refuse to obey government authorities out of obedience to God. But there are also times when Christians should go ahead and submit to those authorities even though the authorities may be acting inappropriately or unjustly. Most of the time, Almost always, our obedience to God requires that we obey those he has placed over us in the government. Scripture is very clear about this. So here's the second of our four texts, each one shorter than the last. 
From Romans 13. Romans is a letter from the Apostle Paul to the church in the city of Rome. Probably about 20 or so years after Acts chapter 5, give or take a little. Romans 13, verse 1. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Now Paul, when he wrote these words, had been a part of the church a long time. And before that, he had been a student under Gamaliel, who spoke so wisely in Acts chapter 5. And he knew Peter personally. And so Paul surely knew the story of Peter saying, we must obey God rather than human beings. And from time to time in the book of Acts, Paul is put in situations where he is being treated badly by the authorities, and and sometimes perhaps where he had to disobey their direct orders. Yet he writes here that Christians are required by God to obey the governing authorities he has placed over us. And we're to submit to them because the governing authorities are established by God. God himself establishes the authority structures in our lives, including governments. Because he is a God of order and peace... God establishes government so that they can provide order and peace for human societies. So by obeying government authorities, we obey God. And if we ask Paul, but, but Paul, what about those times when the government requires believers to do what would be wrong in God's sight? Well, Paul just doesn't address that question here. That's just not the direction he goes in his teaching here. So in that case, we go back to Peter saying in Acts 5, we must obey God rather than human beings. And yet, Peter himself also taught what Paul taught in Romans 13. This is our third text, 1 Peter 2, verse 11. 1 Peter 2, verse 11, the first letter we have from Peter to the churches. Peter writes, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Peter offers the same teaching here as uh, Paul did in Romans 13. We honor God by obeying the human authorities in our lives. Peter writes, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. When we submit to the authorities who are over us, we do it for God. And this is part of how we live such good lives among unbelievers, that they may see our good deeds and glorify God. People see that we're trying to live responsibly, respectfully. We're trying to honor the authorities over us. And that honorable behavior 
brings honor to our God. In verse 16, Peter says, Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. It's really tempting to use our freedom as an excuse to disobey a government order we disagree with. It's even tempting to argue that God wants us to push back or even rebel against those authorities who, in our opinion, are abusing their authority or acting inappropriately. Now, we're very blessed to live in a nation that affords us, by law and under the Constitution, some freedom to speak out or to press for change when we believe the government is acting inappropriately. But the freedom we enjoy in Christ is not freedom to just do whatever we want. We must not, in the name of freedom, decide that we can defy government orders that we disagree with. We are to live as God's slaves. Slaves don't get to determine what they will or won't do. Their master decides that. So we obey the authorities God has placed over us, not because they're right, not even because we agree with them, but because God, our master, has told us to. And yet... I told you this was a complex issue, right? Even when our first impulse is to submit to the will of God our Master by submitting to the authorities over us, there are still those times when we have to say, like Peter in Acts 5, we must obey God rather than human beings. So when is it right to respond one way, and when is it right to respond the other That's where we hit difficulty, trying to figure out what is the right thing to do in a given situation. Maybe in one situation it's right for Peter and the apostles to stop speaking and teaching in the name of Jesus. But maybe in another situation, similar but different, it's best for the apostle Paul at the end of Acts chapter 13 to obey the city authorities and leave town and go teach about Jesus elsewhere. Both were the right thing to do, each in its own situation. This past year, churches have struggled to know what to do with each new change in COVID regulations. Some churches, like ours, stopped meeting in person altogether for a while. Others stopped for a while and then restarted after a few weeks. Others stayed open all the way through, but made some other adjustments. And as long as they were trying to do uh, what's right in God's sight the best they could, I think it's wise for us to give them some grace, just like you've given to one another. For all of us, this was our first pandemic. We have been learning on the fly this year. Maybe in the years to come, we'll look back and have a clearer understanding of where we did well and where we could have done better. Corey Ten Boom decided it was best for her in service to God to lie and to steal and to hide Jews in her home in order to save as many lives as possible from the Nazis. Her sister Noli hid Jews in her home too, but when the Germans asked her if she was hiding Jews, she felt that before God she could not tell a lie. And so she said, yes, she was hiding Jews. She believed that God would protect the Jewish woman she was hiding because Noli had been trying to honor God by telling the truth. God would not punish her for telling the truth. And that Jewish woman was caught and arrested and imprisoned. But then she escaped And so maybe Noli was right. Maybe. I think one of the reasons Corey Ten Boom's book is a classic among Christians is because she's so honest in how she describes the difficulty of figuring out what the right thing to do was in each situation, how best to save lives, how best to honor God. Churches in China can actually meet openly if they register with the government and accept certain restrictions on their activities and perhaps their teaching. A lot of Chinese Christians choose to meet secretly rather than to submit to these restrictions. But others go ahead and register. Well, which one one is right? There are some churches allowed to meet 
in Iran. But they can only include people born into non-Muslim families. Anyone converting from Islam or anyone trying to convert someone from Islam can be executed under the law. Would you, as a Christian, be able to abide by that limitation? And so there's a dynamic tension between these two responses to government authority because both of them are right in God's sight in certain situations, but not in others. Sometimes we are to obey out of obedience to God. Sometimes we are to disobey out of obedience to God. And in any case, as Peter mentioned, we're not to use our freedom as an excuse to do evil. We're not to go out and break the law on religious grounds when it's not necessary to do so. We are slaves of God and must conduct ourselves honorably. So these are the principles churches and church leaders everywhere have been grappling with this past year. And we learned as we went, because this was a new situation for us all. This was our first pandemic, and Lord willing, it'll be our last One thing we recognized early on was that the question about whether we should obey a government order to close our gatherings was not the only question we needed to consider. We also needed to take into account the question about whether we needed to close our gatherings in order to protect each other's health. In fact, uh, the elders were discussing that question before we received any orders from the state. And that question brought to mind another vital principle in Scripture and one that sometimes helps us discern how we should respond to a government order. This is our final text this morning, and it's our shortest. It's something that Jesus taught us in the book of Mark, chapter 12, beginning in verse 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than than these. Jesus taught us that the two greatest commands are to love God and to love our neighbors. When it's hard to tell whether we should obey or disobey government authorities, part of the way we discern what God wants us to do is by aiming to do what best helps us to love our neighbors as ourselves. So in the early days of the pandemic, when no one in the world really understood this new virus very well yet or how it would affect people, how it would spread, one of the key perspectives that moved churches to close their doors for a while was the sense that doing so would be the best way to show our love for one another and for our neighbors in the community. On the one hand, we felt a need to meet together as God has commanded us and as we need to do for our own good. On the other hand, we sensed a need to stay apart, to fulfill God's command to love our neighbors. Every church had to weigh these two principles against each other and decide what to do. Corey Ten Boom was swayed to defy the German authorities because, well, frankly, because they were not the rightful government in Holland, but also because that was what she needed to do to show her love for her Jewish neighbors in her situation. In our very different situation, our congregation followed the regulations placed on us in the hope that that would be the best way for us to show love for our neighbors. And thankfully, technology allowed us to continue to meet uh, online together, and so we were able to do at least that much and, and are continuing to keep that option open for those who need it today. And here we are today, hoping that in a few weeks we might be able to reopen fully and not have to grapple with these complex questions anymore. And so these are the principles we've been weighing and struggling with this past year, trying to understand what God wants us to do at each step along the way, careful to show grace to people or churches that think differently than we do ourselves, because this is always a complex issue, even in China or Iran today even in Nazi-controlled Holland in the 1940s. And so to pull all of this together, 
when we think about whether in a given situation we should obey God or the government, our thinking, guided by Scripture, should go something like this. Number one, we must always obey God. We must always, always obey God. Number two, obeying God almost always means obeying the government. Number three, when the, even when the government seems to act inappropriately or to abuse its authority from God, we should still obey whenever possible, whenever doing so does not cause us to disobey or to dishonor God. This honors God in the sight of the people around us as they see that we're trying to live honorably. Number four, when it's hard to tell what we should do, doing what loves our neighbors best is usually right. And number five, when it's just impossible to obey the government and obey God, we go back to number one. We must always obey God. We must obey God rather than human beings. Lord willing, we'll never have to get to number five in this country in our lifetimes. But if we do, you'll know what to do. May the Lord grant wisdom and courage to those who govern us. May he guide them in all they do. May he even work through them to build among us a society in which his kingdom may continue to advance without hindrance. And may God give us wisdom in the days ahead to understand what is right and good in every situation and the courage to do it. And may he bless you today. Let's pray together. Our Father, you know how difficult this past year has been for churches and for our church too, trying to understand what's the best thing to do in every given situation at every moment as uh, guidelines and regulations have, have been imposed and then have shifted from time to time. Uh, even today, as we look forward to reopening fully soon uh, by your grace, Lord, you know how hard this has been uh, for elders and for uh, leaders uh, in all your churches, really uh, probably around the world or at least in most places. And you know, Lord, how hard it's been on church members trying to uh, decide in their own hearts and minds what's best and trying to work with their leaders. And we thank you so much for the grace you've given us in this congregation that we have had a great deal of peace. And though we've been frustrated sometimes or maybe haven't always agreed with, with what's happened or, or what's, uh, what we've been called to do, uh, there has been tremendous uh, kindness shown one person to another. Thank you so much, dear God. We thank you for leading us and helping us this past year, for giving us a measure of wisdom, and we, we hope and pray that we've used it well. Lord, whatever is to come in the days ahead, would you guide us and help us? Would you bless our leaders? Would you bless our president and our Congress? Would you bless our governor and the state legislature? Would you bless our courts from the top all the way down? Would you bless our local leaders? Give them wisdom, Lord, to know what is best to do and to do it. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to discern correctly and, uh, and wisely uh, what is the right thing to do in every situation. Please, dear God, don't ever let our obedience to government authorities become an idol in our lives that we would place before you, but let us give you our first allegiance in everything. And it is out of love for you and out of a desire to obey you faithfully that we ask you for wisdom in regard to these things. Lord, bless your churches in this city and across the world. Bless us here today. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.